And we're here to celebrate this fantastic new book that I hope you've all read thoroughly from cover to cover. Uh, the, uh, the first biography in modern times, and really the first scholarly biography, I think, in English, of Josef Piasunski. Um, let me just briefly introduce our, our, our speaker. We're very fortunate today to have with us Professor Joshua Zimmerman. Um, who took his BA in Santa Cruz, his MA in UCLA, and got a PhD from Brandeis in 1998, and is currently the Eli and Diana Swarovski Chair in Holocaust History, yes. which I believe was the first endowed chair at any American university in Holocaust history. That is true. It was endowed in 1974. Right. Yeah. And uh, Eli Swarovski was a survivor of the Holocaust, a Polish Jew, uh, um, who I think had experienced at first hand, it's fair to say, um, the whole spectrum of what life as a Polish Jew in, in those years could offer. So uh, we're very lucky, I think, to have you with us uh, to talk today about the new book. And I'll just mention that Joshua is the author of two previous uh, monographs, Poles, Jews and the Politics of Nationality, which is a book that I found very fascinating, uh, a study of the relationship between the Development of Polish political nationalism and the Bund uh, in pre First World War Poland, and the Polish underground and the Jews uh, in the Second World War, and two books of collected essays as well. So, Professor Zimmerman is going to speak to us for about 40 or 45 minutes, uh, and there will then be plenty of time for questions, and we'll wrap up uh, about somewhere between 1 15 and 1 30. Well, um, thank you so much, Professor Mazover and uh, the Harriman Institute and for inviting me. Uh, it's really uh, an honor to be speaking at this institute when it that just celebrated its 75th anniversary last year, which is the oldest institute of Russian and Soviet uh, studies uh, in America. Uh, and I believe that just seven or eight years later, the, the, the Institute on East Central Europe came into being as well. And that institute for me uh, became very important. And I was just gonna sh show this uh, as an example that when I was studying uh, to write this biography, one of the main works on the issue of, of Joseph Kosutsky's foreign policy uh, was uh, um, these contributed papers from the Harriman Institute, uh, uh, Institute on East Central Europe published in 2007 from a conference that took place in 2005 that was hosted by uh, the late Piotr Pondich and then the, the center's um, head, who is uh, Professor John Mitzkiel. And there, there, among those papers is the paper by a young uh, Polish historian named Marek Kornat, uh, which is the policy of equilibrium and Polish bilateralism in uh, the 1930s. And he's today the most renowned specialist on Polish foreign policy between the two world wars. Uh, and since Kosicki was the leader of Poland between 1918 and 1935, that, that figure and his policies are explored in detail. So this is one of the first times I could look in detail because uh, as Professor Mazover said, there's no real, there was no real scholarly biography uh, in, in English. And, and actually the, the, the first time I ever learned of the name Joseph Kosutsky or Yusuf Kosutsky was as an undergraduate at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And it was just by walking in to the library and on the new books shelf, I saw this book by Neil Asherson called The Struggles for Poland, published in 1987. And I started flipping through those pages. And for the first time I saw the name Kosutsky. And, and what stood out to me is a statement there, which he said that Kosutsky was opposed to anti-Semitism and it fought it his whole life. That's just the essence of what he said. And that intrigued me because at the time I only knew the stereotype kind of, of Poland as having anti-Semitic tendencies. So for me, I was I'm always interested in tensions between collective memory on the one hand, and then the, the tension between that and the uh, and the head of state. So if the country in collective memory was anti-Semitic or the claim is, but the leader of the country is uh, a foe of anti-Semitism, then does that mean he's just an, uh, he's just, uh, an exception, an anomaly, or does it represent 
a current in Polish society and Polish thought. Uh, so I was always, uh, you know, reticent about um, stereotypes because they can only be partial truths, right? So that intrigued me. Uh, and then I looked and found that there was a book um, published in 1981 by Václav Jędrzejewicz, who was the head of the Pilsudski Institute in New York, um, called Pilsudski, A Life for Poland. But that's a popular um, biography with no footnotes and a two-page bibliography at the end. Uh, and then I noticed over time that, uh, for example, in 1997, in the pages of the American Historical Review, uh, a historian named Robert Blobom uh, reviewed um, <clears throat> an English translation of what was considered the authoritative biography of Pilsudski by Andrzej Galitsky. It came out in 1988. There was a, an abridged translation, and uh, and and this uh, professor said that unfortunately there is no scholarly biography of Pilsudski in any language because this was produced by a historian uh, who was trained in communist Poland, and uh, he in many ways uh, was anticipating the censor because in communist Poland between 1948 and 1989 Pilsudski was demonized as a foe of progress. Uh, an enemy of the Soviet Union uh, and as a fascist. So that's how he was demonized in, in the communist period. There, now there were, that had almost no relation to what Poles felt, but that's what was, that was, was the official line. And in some ways this biography reflected that, but it also reflected a little bit of a transition uh, because the censor was, was easing by the mid 1980s. Um, and then, in 2005, in the pages of the New York Review of Books, uh, Professor Simon Montefiore from, from London uh, wrote that uh, it's unfortunate that in English there's no adequate biography of Pilsudski. Uh, and so that was kind of my, my, you know, kind of my call for uh, pursuing this. Um, so um, after my two books on Poland, on Polish-Jewish relations, uh, I delved into this subject. And so I'm gonna um, actually begin by offering two quotations that represent the two different currents of thought about Piłsudski in the historical literature. The first is by Adam Michnik, who is today the editor-in-chief of Gazeta Wyborcza, which is the kind of New York Times of Poland, the daily paper. Uh, he's a, a, a kind of a, a solidarity of, um, activists who in the 1980s was jailed, wrote letters from prison that were published in the New York Review of Books, then a whole book came out, and, and uh, he has written many uh, prominent uh, um, books since then. In this case, we have a, something very interesting. In 1973, in Paris, there's a Polish journal called Kultura, represent, representing Polish emigres, and they hosted a contest on essays about Kosutsky, and they would print the first prize, the one that got was considered the most important. And so an unknown person from Poland with a pseudonym was able to smuggle out an essay to Paris, and they publish it under this, this pseudonym, uh, a pseudonym, uh, with, uh, and the real name is Adam Mitnick. He was 27 year, years old at the time. And this is what he wrote, quote, Kosutsky saw Poland as the motherland of many nations, a commonwealth of many cultures. He wanted, to, he wanted it to be a state in which not only Poles, but also Lithuanians, Ukrainians, and Jews could live in solidarity. He was formed by the specific climate of the Vilna province, the common motherland of peoples from different nations, cultures, and religions, unquote. So this is the Pilsudski, who was a pluralist, a Democrat, who wanted a commonwealth of nations in which the definition of Polish is not ethnic, but political. What is a Pole? He or she who is a citizen of Poland, deserving of complete equal rights, equality before the law, and the state will guarantee those rights uh, in a system in which everybody's vote counts equally, whether or not you're a minority, you're a woman. One of the things I bring out is that he um, insisted when Poland became a state in the first electoral law 
which was about three weeks after polling against the state, that women get the right to vote. And he insisted this over the objection of the parliament that said women are too conservative, they're mostly pious and Catholic, and if you allow women the right to vote, um, then, then actually uh, you know, the, 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 friend, the, the vote will be skewed towards the right. And he, his response was, uh, because during the First World War in the Polish legions, which he headed, there were women's battalions. He said if there were women who, who stood on the front lines and, and uh, put their bodies in harm's way in a war with Russia, then how is it possible we, we will now deny them the right to vote? And so he insisted on that, and Poland became the fourth country in the Western world to give women the right to vote after Austria, Germany, and Sweden. No, I'm sorry, I forgot the third country. Austria, Germany, and one other that I forgot, but of uh, long before the United States, long before France, long before uh, Britain. So he had that. Now let me just go to the next quote, which is by that historian Andrzej Gorlitsky, um, uh, the late Andrzej Gorlitsky, who was considered the, uh, to have written the first authoritative scholarly biography. Uh, full of you know, footnotes and archival uh, research and references. Quote, and this is from 1988. Piłsudski believed that he was able to shape the course of history, that Poland's destiny was dependent on his will and that, like other greats from the past, he should dominate over all others, unquote. So do you see the contrast between these two? One is he's a kind of ruthless, in a way, dictator, who has placed himself at the center of power, claimed that he and only he understands the, uh, the, you know, the security of and the welfare of his state, and that only he can, can uh, forge ahead uh, and, no, and kind of no one else. So that's the two, the, the twin uh, uh, kind of, the, you can say the, the twin positions of Pilsudski. On the one hand, he was the man who stood at the head of state when World War I ended on November 11th, 1918. On that day, Pilsudski was named commander in chief of the new Poland. Three days later, he was handed the keys to power and named head of state and asked to form a provisional government. Uh, and uh, I'm just gonna pause there and say, we'll, we'll come back to that. And he proceeds to put Poland on a democratic transition where he creates a freely elected parliament. That parliament drafts the country's first constitution, which includes an independent judiciary, equality before the law, and right, freedom of the press, a religion, kind of basic uh, democratic freedoms. Uh, and he, as head of state, presides over that transition to, to democracy. It's that same person, Kosinski, who in 1926, when he's out of power, brings a military force into Warsaw on May 12, 1926, and demands that the president of Poland dissolve the government that Pilsudski believes is, is a nationalist, right-wing, anti-Semitic government that is moving the country into chaos, one in which they will disenfranchise minority voters. And he said, this is not the Poland I spent half of my life trying to create and build. And so he actually then, because the president said no, then he instituted a coup d'etat. And from that point on until around 1935, when he um, passes away, he is considered an authoritarian leader. So Poland goes through a transition from parliamentary democracy between 1918 and 1926 to authoritarian rule, 1926 to um, 1935. Okay, I'm gonna now, uh, um, start going through um, some of the um, the slides and the uh, materials that I prepared for this, just to introduce you to the person that is very well known. I was um, uh, I, I did a podcast on a show called Historically Thinking. Um, they saw the book in a catalog and asked me, and he and the uh, person um, who was interviewing me said something like. Um, Kosutsky is literally, he said, is the most interesting man I barely ever heard of, which is, the way he, which is that he's not that well known at all in the West, outside of Poland and outside of, let's say, Polish immigrant community and among, let's say, even among general historians, he's little known. Um, to give you an example, when I was 
when I was um, preparing for my oral exams at Brandeis, we were told, you know, you know, rely heavily on this major textbook, Powell and Colton, the history of the, of the modern world, uh, you know, from 1500 to the present. And I, I noticed only later that Kosinski doesn't appear in that volume. So according to this history of the modern world, which is mostly about Europe, uh, he has no real central role in there. Uh, you know, and so he's he's almost got, got lost in collective memory. So I'm going to start by looking at Kosinski's um, ancestry and childhood, and we'll go to um, start with Kosinski's parents, Yusef and Maria, circa 1864, uh, in Zulu, which is today north of Vilnius in independent Lithuania. Um, the significance of Kosinski's ancestry is this. Of course, he's born at a time where Poland doesn't exist on the map of Europe. But the memory of Poland is everywhere to be found, in the, especially in the, uh, in the educated elite of that society. And it turns out that in 1863, which is four years before Kosinski was born, his parents got married two months after the so-called Polish insurrection started. And his father was part of that insurrection. Now, when in 1864 that insurrection collapsed, the couple had to flee from the very east, sorry, west of Lithuania uh, to another estate that the family owned uh, 200 miles uh, eastward to escape capture from the police because the father was on a wanted list. Uh, you may know that, that if you actually look at the figures, it's staggering that when the Polish insurrection failed, by the end of 1864, we think that about 26,500 Poles were put in chains and sent into Siberian exile. About 10,000 fled in emigration, uh, and there were massive arrests. About, we think that um, hundreds of Polish insurrectionaries were summarily executed as well. So it was considered a tragedy. So it kind of hung over that family. Uh, it was a shadow over his childhood. Uh, and, and that childhood is important because as he explains that when he was growing up five, six, seven, eight, um, that his mother, he said, was a great patron. So he said that um, he got his intellect from his father, but a passion for social justice from his mother. And that his mother used to hold clandestine readings of national poets uh, when, when they were small children, and they described this. And so I want to give you just one quote from Kosinski's older brother, and that is, uh, this is a photo of Kosinski at age five, and his older brother, Bronislav, who was age seven. And so two years later, they would move to Vilnius, but um, the, the brother um, made this statement in an interview. Quote, the national idea based on the works of our greatest poets was for us a type of Bible. Our mother read them to us out loud in out loud in the evenings during secret gatherings. Uh, and then Kosutsky reflected on the significance of this, and he wrote, thinking about this time, quote, I must say that from our earliest years, my mother tried to develop in us uh, in uh, independence of thought and uh, and encouraged a feeling of personal dignity, uh, which she, he said, um, said was sacrifice for the nation, sacrifice for the nation. So in a way, it was a home of conspiracy. Um, the shades were dropped down, voices, there was in hushed voices, books were taken out of secret cabinets with lock and key, and she would read out loud, the great poets. One of them was Adam Mickiewicz, who's considered one of the three Polish bards of the 19th century. Um, but I can just give you one sense and try to place yourself in the mind of a six, seven-year-old and, and the mother's reading this out loud. And she says, what I want you to do is learn this by heart, this particular passage. We know this from the, the recollections of his brother uh, that she asked them to um, learn this out loud. And so I, I give you uh, this one example of, of Adam Mickiewicz's famous Holy Mess, Polish Messianic text called uh, 
called the Book of the Polish Pilgrims. I'm sorry, the Book of the Polish Nation and Pilgrims. It was a kind of biblical style chronicle of the Polish past. And, and remember how important this can be in the absence of a state, literature in the vernacular becomes a, a becomes a key uh, when this literature is uh, is is banned and and they're being forced to learn in Russian and and curriculums that are about Russian history. So th this is an example from, from the end of that long book. Quote, from the slavery of Moscow, of Austria, and of Prussia, deliver us, O Lord, it states. Uh, for a universal war of the freedom of peoples, we beseech you, O Lord, for the arms and the eagles of our nation, we beseech you, O Lord, for the burial of our bones in our own lands, we beseech you, O Lord, for the independence, unity, and freedom of our fatherland, we beseech you, O Lord. So I think these can be powerful words to children, uh, especially from a mother who's saying that she wants to raise boys who will go into battle to help reconstitute an independent Polish state. So the childhood is very clear, a very patriotic childhood. Um, we also have um, uh, statements um, about Kosinski from his siblings that are valuable. This is just to give you an example. This is his oldest sister. Now, Kosinski was one of 10, which is kind of interesting. He was the fourth uh, of 10, the second son, but uh, his, his favorite was his sister, Sophia, who was born just two years before him. They would pass away actually the same year, 1935. Uh, but this is an example. He had, let's see, this is not, oh, here we go. This was his oldest sister, and then his youngest sister. It's just small things. And then he had these two brothers, Kashmir's and Adam. Okay, now what happens in Kosutsky's upbringing is that um, by a, a teenager, by the age of 16, he starts defining himself as a socialist. He went to the Vilna State, sorry, the Russian State Gymnasium in Vilna. He sat in the same class as his brother. Uh, because he was an advanced learner. And there, you know, he reflects very much on what he called this oppressive atmosphere in the school, which is Russian teachers speaking in ill words about Poland, the Poles. Uh, it was illegal to speak Polish. So we have these cases in which he's reprimanded for insisting on speaking Polish. His brother talks about a time where, uh, where in, when he was 15 and the brother was six, 17, there was a history class by a Russian history teacher who spoke disparagingly about Poland, and Kosutsky got up to say something. His brother, his brother grabbed him and threw him, to sit, threw him back in the seat. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because uh, he, he was enraged by what was being said, and he talks about that a lot. Now, this was a clandestine study group uh, that he and his brother were in, in which, and what was that? He was, he was 16 at the time, and Forgot that I had this. So you see, this is this is working. Yeah. So here's Pilsudski at age 16, and his brother is 18, Bronislaw. And there's two other members of this secret study group, and you can see the postcard that says 1885. And there they studied in a secret group socialist literature uh, and historical works about Polish uprisings, the one in 1863. The one in 1830. They also were reading um, original Polish texts about Marxism and social democracy, but also they were studying, because remember, we're speaking about the context of imperial Russia, absolutist monarchy at a time where they were very much aware that Germany, Austria, Hungary, France were constitutional monarchies uh, with equality before the law, parliamentary government, um, in which opposition presses were open and legal. Uh, and they're in a, in a uh, society in which it is illegal uh, to publish anything outside of a censorship. There are no political parties and there's absolutist rule. So, so keep, they're trying to pull together works from outside because they haven't been abroad to figure out what are these systems. So they're studying works of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and all illegal literature, right? This is not allowed. So it's an important moment where he suddenly says, he is a socialist. Now, what does it mean to be a Polish socialist inside Imperial Russia, where there is no Poland? And that is that he developed a very unique um, and subscribed to a very unique aspect in which he would combine 
social democracy with the struggle for an independent Poland. So I want to just <clears throat> give you uh, a sense of exactly what he meant by that. And then, and that, that is this. So when he becomes a full-fledged socialist and joins an underground party, he says the following, our fight for the transformation of the political system is indistinguishable from the struggle for independence. So this is where there's a, there's a specific Polish uh, socialist movement, which is that the Russian socialist movement is not calling for the independence of the minority peoples on the Western rim of the empire. They're calling for a transformation of, of Russia into a, a federal, a federal um, uh, monarch, and sorry, not monarch, a federal republic, but not for the, any changes in borders. And this is where we're going to see lots of shifts and differences. So I'm going to just start moving forward. Um, is this working? Let's see. Okay, here we go. So these are just in the book. I'm, this is kind of too, too small to see here, but but I included family trees that I spend um, stretching way more time than I thought. And part of it is because of his brother. So here's Yusuf, right, with his nine siblings. And these, this is his and his are his descendants going down to his most recent descendants, right, born in 2019. In, sorry, in 2019. Did I get that right? Yeah. Down here, right, born. This is a great, great granddaughter born, uh, granddaughter and grandson born here. But it was his brother, Bronislav, that fascinated me. Um, and that is, and we'll get into that uh, uh, about mm -hmm. myself. And that is, we're going to look at this for a moment, arrest in exile. Why did I say that I was fascinated with this older brother, Bronislav? Because of this, we'll go to this map. So it turns out that Piłsudski did attend university at the University of Kharkiv in the 1885 1886 academic year, um, but he was not allowed to continue because of two infractions. One was he was involved in one of these secret study groups where they studied socialist literature in Russian. And the second is that in the spring of 1886, it happened to be the 25th anniversary of peasant emancipation. So there was a kind of uh, uh, student demonstration marking that, and it was an unofficial demonstration. So you had a second infraction and they wouldn't allow him to continue. So he goes back to his home in, in Vilna, and there he gets more involved in socialist um, organizations. And it turns out that his older brother, Bronislav, is a student at St. Petersburg University. Uh, and in 1887, his brother is linked in some ways to a terrorist cell of the Narodnaya Volia, right? the, the people's will. And they are planning to assassinate Tsar Alexander III. So while Piłsudski is at home in Vilnius, his brother um, spends the summer of 1887 uh, um, home from, from university, but he also has a friend who accompanies him for two or three days. Little did, did the, young, the younger Piłsudski know that this friend was an actual member of the terrorist cell who was actively planning the uh, assassination. And just by association, when this plot was uncovered, uh, both Bronislaw, the older brother, and Yusef were arrested. In 1887. So they're arrested and both convict, both found guilty of conspiracy. And Piłsudski was given a sentence of five years Siberian exile. He was 19 years old. And so I'm just going to show you this is this map is just to show you the 4,000 plus mile traveling he was uh, to do here to get to Kirenz, which is a small island about 650 miles north of Ir Irkutsk. And he spends the next five years there. Now, his brother, on the other hand, who is more involved, gets a 15-year sentence, and he's dispatched to this island called the Sakhalin Islands from 1887 at the age of 20 or 21, literally to the age of 36, 1905. He's on this Japanese island. And the brother ends up becoming an ethnographer. He's interested in the local Japanese population. It's under Russian rule, but the local population is Japanese. He, uh, you know, this is between 21 and 35. He meets someone, he gets married, and he has a child. So when 1905 rolls around with the rest, 1904, five with the Russo-Japanese War, 
Um, once the Japanese um, start taking this island, he's forced to flee. He has a three-year-old son and his wife is pregnant with the, their second child. He flees, but, the, uh, but his wife does not accompany him. He goes back to Europe. He never sees them again. But it turns out that if we went back to our family tree, um, that his two children ended up having uh, other, you know, children. What you'll see here, if I can, I'm not seeing where the, if this is working, but, uh, is that, no, here we go. So here's Bronnie saw, but what you'll notice is that he has 13 great grandchildren in Japan today. And because the male line ended in Poland, the only Kosinski surname today is in Japan. 13 great grandchildren. And so I was able to document this, but for some reason, I was never able to get a hold of any individual descendant of Kosinski in Japan. So I was basing it on books and different um, things I found. So I was able to get you know, enough to find these names and dates of the 13 great grandchildren. The reason I knew it is because in 2018, there was a meeting in Krakow to celebrate Bronisław Kosutsky's ethnographic study of the native population of the Sakhalin Islands. It was a, called an international conference of the study of the works of Bronisław Kosutsky. Um, and present were something like 10 members, 10 people from Japan uh, attending this conference. And uh, what's interesting is that before Yusuf Kosutsky was known, his older brother was known. Why? Because in 1912, he published in, in English, because he had already been back from exile in English, a study, the first known study of the local um, folk culture of that island. He documented their songs, their dress, and he, he apparently came up with the first dictionary of the native tongue of that island. And it was reviewed in folklore journals all around the world, in, in New York, in San Francisco, in London, in Berlin. Uh, in 1912. So it's interesting that the older brother would be known um, before Kosutsky. But it, I would say one of the cruelties of this is that is that just think they're very close brothers who are one and a half years apart. Uh, and on three occasions during Kosutsky's exile, he officially filed to be transferred to Sakhalin very clearly and explicitly so he could be with his brother. And three times it was denied. So he didn't see his brother for 15 years. Uh, before the brother uh, appears in Krakow in, in uh, 1907. Um, so, and, and part of the cruelty of the exile was that upon Kosinski's return, he was slapped with a decree that said, you're, for the next five years, you're not allowed to study at any university. So think of that from the point of view of a student. From 19 to 24, he's in exile. And he comes back and they say, until you're 29, you can't study. But they don't like arrest him or say, well, here are some other options. They just let him, you know, he let him tend to himself and build it. And what does he do? He then spearheads a socialist movement that will then bring down the Russian Empire, actually. Um, so it's interesting, you know, how that backfired that policy, because what he wanted to do was study medicine, but he wasn't allowed to. Okay, so let's just go back here for a minute. Okay, so I wanted to say that in exile, what's important about the period of exile? I see that I'm um, way behind here. And that is that in exile, there was almost like a, a, a roving kind of like uh, ad, ad hoc university. Why is that? Because in exile, he met people who had been there for much longer. One was Stanislav Landy, uh, who was one of Pilsudski's mentors in Siberia in exile, um, founding member of the first Polish Socialist Party in 1878 in Warsaw. It was uh, dissolved by the Russian authorities and he was sent into exile. Uh, and so the 19-year-old Kosinski meets this 35-year-old uh, founder of the Polish uh, so socialist movement. Now, I make the claim that this is the beginning of Kosinski's understanding, a unique understanding of the, of the Jewish issue in Poland. Why is that? Because Stanislaw Landy happens to be a Pole of Jewish background, but his uncle, Michael Landy, uh, in 1863, was shot and killed in a demonstration in Warsaw for Poland when the, when the Russians arrived. And so what, what Pilsudski encountered in this two-year uh, friendship was that we have a Polish Jew who's in exile because he fought for Poland, right? He, he's paying the ultimate, or not the ultimate, but a, 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 a steep price, and that he has an uncle who gave his life for Poland, but he was Jewish. So he started rethinking, well, if 
how does this square with the stereotype that Jews are unpatriotic and uninterested in Polish affairs and un, you know, not, you know, well, actually that's not the case at all. So he, I think this is a key time where he developed a special uh, understanding for the Jewish problem. It'll be one of his distinctive characteristics. Okay, let me move on, although this clicker is working. These are just things like his first love was in exile at age 19. Um, why is this important? Because nine months after they meet and fall in love, her exile is up and she returns to Russia and there's three years of correspondence and she saved every letter and they were preserved and then they were published. So we have um, what we, we have a window into his thinking at age 19, 20, 21. And one of those is the following that I'll just um, give because I think it's important just to understand the mindset who was who was Kosinski, and that is in one of the letters, he he makes this statement. And that is this. She's asking, how, how have you been? He says he's pretty down. This is 1891. He's got a whole nother year of exile. He's been there for four years. He says, and he says the following. He goes, the thing, my love, is that this same mental state leaves me with the faith, with faith in my ability and connected to this belief that an, un, an uncommon destiny awaits me. 1891. So he's 20, 23 years old when he writes this, that he has this powerful belief that an uncommon destiny awaits him. So we have some insight into what he's thinking about his future. Okay, so we'll move on here. Try to get... oh, am I supposed to point this somewhere else? Oh, maybe here. Okay. And this is just an example of the, how do you say this kind of, um, you know, the education of the young Kosinski is that his second mentor in, in Siberian Exile, more influential, was Bronislav Schwarz. Now, who is he? He was in the found, he was a uh, member of the illegal Polish national government in Warsaw that declared insurrection and separation from Russia in 1863. He was actually part of the conspiracy. He was arrested and sent to 30 years exile. 27 years later, the, the, the now 21-year-old Kosinski meets a 54-year-old senior member of the Polish Nap National Uprising. And you have to understand, he was raised with the belief that these were the great heroes of the nation. They gave their, their lives, they sacrificed everything for this great cause. And so he, he sat and spoke in detail with him about the uprising. And how do we know this? Because Kosinski himself would at one point in 1912 give a 10-part lecture series in Krakow on the Polish uprising of 1863. It was published, and when you look through those, there's several cases in which he quotes him, and he's, he, there's a footnote saying this is from a conversation he had in, in Siberia. So he actually, you can see the young mind, which is he's not only speaking to a great hero, he's actually writing down notes as he's speaking to this uh, mentor who would be like maybe uh, an esteemed professor at a university. Now, uh, part three, which is return from exile, and I'll go through this and just say that he, he um, returns in the summer of 1892, and there he meets uh, who will be his future wife, Maria Yushkevich, um, whom he meets in Vilna in 1893 in a clandestine reading group. They married in 1899. Strange thing. Little tidbit about this in that same reading group was a young man named Roman Domowski, who would become the leader of the right wing opposition in Poland and a lifelong Polo Kosinski. It turns out they both fell in love with the same woman and she chose Kosinski. Uh, could that have had any impact on that long, lifelong antagonism between the two? Possibly, possibly. Uh, <coughs> because of the bitterness of his opposition to Kosinski his whole life. So let's talk about this. What happened is that in 1893, um, some very kind, interesting person appears in Vilna. His name is Stanislav Mendelssohn. He's just come from Paris and he, he uh, informs Pilsudski and this group, this kind of a, a, a kind of clandestine circle of socialists, that a new party has been founded in Paris called the Polish Socialist Party, and that his program is social democracy in an independent Poland. So the separation of Poland and social democracy, and he hands them this program. It calls for uh, 
full equality before the law. It calls for um, it calls for labor legislation and eight hour working, uh, equal pay for equal work for men and women, and the independence of Poland. So kind of a social democratic Poland, but the independence. So he for him this becomes uh, um, you know kind of he deeply identifies with this program. And he agrees to sit as kind of head of this kind of Lithuanian section of the party. Uh, very quickly, he rises up to be the head of this Polish Socialist Party. Um, and the significance here uh, is that is that um, he's tasked with with starting their first newspaper because they had a newspaper abroad, but they asked Pilsudski, "Can you somehow smuggle in a printing press from Germany?" Start up and print monthly in a legal in a legal newspaper, uh, and he takes up the task with Lasso. And in 1894, the first issue of that journal, Robotnik, appears. It rails against the czar system. It calls for the overthrow of the czar, the replacement of the czar by a democratic Russia, uh, and also freedom of and rights of people to self determination. Um, it is the most. He becomes the most wanted man. Uh, in Russia, but he's uh, an experienced conspirator, and he's able to somehow produce these these newspapers with this underground printing press, um, uh, all the way until 1900. About about uh, 51 issues appear, for which the penalty is immediate imprisonment and possible exile to Siberia. Um, this is uh, an example at age 32, where Pasitsky and his wife and his stepdaughter Wanda are in, are in Lodge or Wuch, and this is taken one month before, after six long years, the Russian secret police finally identify him. They raid the house, they confiscate the printing press, they arrest both Pilsudski and his wife, Maria, uh, and the daughter, Wanda, who's 12 or I believe 13 at the time, is somehow allowed to be go with like local cousins or family, and they're both arrested. Now, Pilsudski's place. In a high security prison, I'm just going to go about arrest and exile here. He's placed in a high security prison. I'm just going to show you this path. This is one of the uh, maps. I can't tell what it is. Oh, okay. Here's one of the map maps in the book. It's showing he was arrested in the lodge, which is right here. He was taken to Warsaw in that prison. And there he came up with an idea that for him to be able to escape, He'd have to get out of this prison because it was a high security prison. And he was told that if you can get transferred to the mental hospital in St. Petersburg um, um, with other prisoners, there's more porous there's authorities that, that are um, less um, able to, um, to, to, to keep watch. And so he's transferred to St. Petersburg to this institution, St. Peter, right, the St. Nicholas. Uh, the miracle, the miracle worker um, hospital for the insane, right? And then he's able miraculously in May 1901 uh, to come up with a scheme, which is basically a scheme by his um, by his party that he would fake. He's faked insanity. He's been informed on what are the symptoms of insanity, uh, and then he get a member of the Polish Socialist Party in Saint Petersburg who just got his medical degree in psychiatry to get a job at the Institute. And that's the person who finds one day, one holiday where there's, where they've thinned out the staff. He orders that this, one of the prisoners, Pasiski, be examined in his office. He puts on uh, uh, clothes of a, of, um, of a hospital official and walks them out. There's a horse drawn buggy waiting for them. And then this is, then this is his path. You'll see, uh, here we go. And then this is his path going here from St. Petersburg to Estonia, all the way down here, and he finally escapes into Austria. Um, into Austria. Now, from 1901, 1902 until 1914, then he um, is active in the Polish Socialist Party. And the main thing, because I'm coming uh, to the end of my time, the, the main task he has there uh, is to, he de decides to build the nucleus of a Polish armed force um, that would be he would develop fear in Austrian militia in the hopes that one day Austria would go, go to war with Russia. And if that happened, he and his armed force could be part of 
of that Austrian incursion into Russia. And it's at that moment when they arrive in, in liberated areas that they can declare an independent form. So that's what he was kind of banking on. And it turns out that, that there's a certain factor of the law, right? If Mississippi had been born not in 1867, but in 1810, we may never have heard about that. But he's now age 46 when World War I breaks out, and the exact scenario that he wanted takes place. Austrian Germany invade Russia, and the Polish armed force, now this is, um, okay, we're gonna go. And the Polish armed force does go into Russia. And as you know, uh, this is an example of Pilsudski uh, heading uh, officer training camps in, uh, in Zakopane in the Tatra Mountains in 1913, and then, sorry, okay. And then of course, World War I and the formation of the Polish Legion, we'll just go quickly through that, and I'll spend a couple more minutes, if, if this will turn. Um, this was a point it here. Oh, here we go. And so what is the importance of this period of the Legions? And that is that Kosutsky heads stands as the head of what's called the commander, what's called the first brigade of the Polish legions. And um, what I wanted to read out loud to you, and then we can actually, um, even though I didn't get through uh, most, you know, most of this talk, but just leave you with, with this impression. And that is that who is Kosuski and what is known um, about him? So, he becomes legendary in the sense that he's head of the first Polish armed force that actually enters Polish land that is taken from Russia uh, and is fighting for Poland at the head of that armed force. But what I want to say is that this is an interesting photograph. It says Krakow, December 1914. In that same month, there was a meeting of the Polish legions in Vienna. Um, because in December 1914, the Russians had done an incursion into East Galicia and they were approaching Krakow. Uh, and so he had to then move uh, to Vienna briefly. And then, then there's a banquet uh, in, in the end of December 1914. And it happens to be that there's a Polish journalist there uh, who is covering, he's sitting at that banquet, he's writing for a Krakow newspaper. And he happened to jot down in his diary on that day, this note. So this would be December 24th, 1914 because Piłsudski gave a toast uh, at this banquet. And this journalist says the following, quote, today all are of the opinion that at the very least, Piłsudski has the making of a historical figure, sharing the fate of the legions, he is their personification, their symbol, unquote. Um, so I think that gives you a sense now, I'm, I'm only I'm just gonna say what happens uh, during the war is that, um, I didn't have a chance to go, but this, this is about the Jewish part of the legions because 10% of Poland uh, of Pilsudski's legions are Jewish because he's known to be friendly to the Jews and have this, this kind of very pluralistic conception of the nation. Uh, and, and I just note here that in this artistic book that's famous from 1928, it's dedicated to Pilsudski, but uh, what I wanted to do was go beyond this because we won't have time. Um, I think here, what's important, if this will let me go back, uh, here we go, is, is this. So um, why do, does he become a legend in the course of World War I? So he forms this armed force that is 10% Jewish, but it also has some Ukrainians as well. So it has minorities. And this is an example of a Jewish officer of Kosinski, in Kosinski's first brigade who perished on the battlefield in 1915 fighting the Russians. His name was Bronislaw Monsbro. Now he became a symbol of the Jewish struggle for Poland, so much so that when a Polish Jewish artist in 1928, Arthur Schick in Paris, does an exhibition of 44 paintings, which he calls the Statue of College, which is basically a history of Jews in Poland and their relationship with the state. He, he comes up with this. I just wanted to show you if it'll let me advance. Okay, so this is this uh, history of the Statue of Kalish, um, and this is the book of art 
the original is very rare. Um, it was it was in French, and I, I was just noticing that no libraries have it. So I went on a used books site called abe.com to look at the which is the statute to college. And there's one copy available, but I was surprised at the price thirty five thousand dollars. <laughs> And that's the only copy available. Otherwise, there's one at the Library of Congress, but no other library has. I'm not sure. I guess it must have been a very limited edition. So, so um, figure number 11 in his series on the history of Jews in Poland is this, the death of Bronislaw Manskroll. So I just wanted to say one thing about that, which is um, that there's an inscription. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay, so there's an inscription in French uh, uh, at the bottom, and the inscription reads this, Bronislaw Manskrow, Lieutenant Colonel of the 1st Brigade of the Polish Legions, died for Poland on October 21st, 1915, in the Battle of Kukla. Glory be to his memory. So that's that's that. And uh, so I think that just shows you this sense uh, about um, Kosutsky that, uh, uh, that he was considered friendly to minorities. Now, I'm just going to go and end with this. Yeah. I'm going to end with this. Okay, so can I just have two, two, two more minutes or three? So this is just an example of a photo I found at the National Museum of Krakow, and they let me reproduce it for the book. And this is just an example of Kosowski, right? Uh, commander of the, of the 1st Brigade, and he's attending an art exhibit in Krakow at the Museum of Fine Arts. And I just thought this is emblematic of how people regarded him in 1916. Remember, there is no Poland, but he's he has the status now of Brigadier General. He's, he's given that by the Austro-Hungarian army, army, and you can see the kind of veneration for him. Uh, but his real legend here, here is meeting with the commander of the Austro-Hungarian armed forces. Uh, his real legend. Here's some other examples of uh, personality. Um, this is an iconic uh, photo, which is that, which is that. Um, uh, this is one month before he's arrested. And so why is he arrested? And I'll end here. In July 1917, the German uh, armed forces, the commander of the German armed forces, demands that Pilsudski, head of the legions, declare an oath of loyalty to Kaiser Wilhelm II and all his troops. And he refuses. He says, I can only declare an oath of loyalty to Poland. And they arrest him. They put him in a prison in Magdeburg for the next 16 months before the before the war ends, he is sitting in a languishing in a prison as a prisoner of conscience. And it is said that this is what catapulted him to the to the um, to the level of national hero at the time that he he that he uh, was a man of integrity who wouldn't sacrifice his principles. That he's saying, like what he said is that you are fighting for a different goal, we are because because we don't want just the restoration of Polish lands from Russia. We want the restoration of lands that Germany um, also took from us in the 18th century. And that's pretty much when they arrested him, saying there will be no, no territorial compromise by Germany once this war, is in, war ends. So he's like, I cannot in good faith work with the, the Germans uh, who are becoming foes of. Uh, so what he predicted, strangely enough, uh, um, he was sometimes known as prophetic, is that two months before World War I started, he gave a, a lecture in Paris in which he predicted that the Germans and Austrians would defeat the Russians, but that eventually the Western allies, France and Britain, would defeat mm -hmm. Germany and Austria. Wrapping up is, is, is perhaps almost like, I'm thinking of like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or Mahatma Gandhi uh, or, or um, other you know, great leaders um, when they're prisoners of conscience, it's and they're sitting in prison saying, saying, I cannot in good conscience uh, be outside of this prison um, when these things are happening, um, you know, that they become great leaders of the nation. So so this catapulted him. And I think the thing I show in my book is for the first time when he's arrested, it's the first time his name appears in the London Times, Times of London, uh, in French newspapers and in the New York Times. Uh, when this event is noted, so they start discovering who is this man sitting in prison that all the polls are now saying is the national hero. So I'll I'll pause there and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have about 15, 20 minutes. Um,
floor is open. And if I could just ask you to introduce yourself, say who you are, and then briefly ask Professor Zimmerman your questions. Please. Uh, I'm John Davis, Justine. I'm just fixing for a number of Oh, wonderful. Um, I'm wondering, he never had any formal military training, and yet he's widely regarded as a military genius. How, how do you think of that? Yeah. So this is one of the main aspects of his biography, which is how do we understand that a person with no military training is considered uh, one of the great military geniuses? And how can we even say that? Like I, I remember coming across uh, a book by a military historian. It's called The 25 uh, Greatest Military Geniuses in History. And Piłsudski is in, in that list going back to ancient times to the present. Um, it could be that he just had this, um, what I say is a extremely high native intellect with a powerful analytical ability. Um, and he was a voracious reader of military history. His hero was Napoleon. And um, I try to emphasize that there's, in my view, is that who a leader admires is, tells you so much about, you know, about that person and why do they admire him. So he admired Napoleon because Napoleon used an armed force to liberate captive peoples, right? Because Napoleon will actually um, push out the Russians, sorry, the Prussians and declare the Duchy of Warsaw in uh, 1807. So it was the idea that an armed force could be a force for good that would liberate. And um, he started um, studying meticulously uh, world uh, important battles in history with an eye to why does one army win over another. He also did meticulous studies of the 1863 uprising. Why did it fail? And what lessons can we learn? And it showed what a pragmatist he was. Because in 1912, he, he's at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow giving a 10-part lecture series on the 1863 uprising. Why? Because it was the 50th anniversary. And there, he it's a very pragmatic approach. This is not a, a hagiographic lecture on the 1863 uprising, he's saying we need to understand why they failed and 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 not to, to do the same mistakes in the future. And he will then argue that a popular uprising in Russia will only achieve bloodshed um, and nothing actually positive. So, so we need to reconfigure how the Polish movement can bring about actually statehood in a pragmatic way. Um, so he, while he venerates the leaders, he talks about mistakes of the past. Uh, I think it's this meticulous study. I want to just give you this example that when he arrives in Krakow, right, he escapes. Uh, um, once he restores his health, because remember, part of faking insanity was he, he would fast and do things that, you know, he'd get a meal and he'd throw it against the wall. He'd have to, so he was in ill health. But once he was, his health was restored, um, those who were um, interacting with him wrote in memoirs that he suddenly developed this voracious appetite for military history. And every time they went to his apartment, this stack of books would get larger and larger, but including that he would write to his friends in London. And to give you an example, in 1905, uh, he asked for a new five-part English language history of the Boer War. And he studied that in detail. He needed to understand. He, and then he started studying in detail the Russo-Japanese War with maps, and then he would study Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and I think he had such an astute intellect that he, he, he started developing an understanding for what makes a uh, what makes an armed force victorious. Because he's kind of legendary for not really ever sustaining losses in, 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 uh, in, in, in battle, right? Uh, that's part of his legend that wherever he's leading, not only that he's head of state, but he's personally leading um, the armed forces, let's say in 1920, uh, against the Red Army, and he defeats them in a major way. Um, so I think that that's still a, a mystery about where he got that. Can I ask you a question? Yes. About, um, it's, it's to do with his greatness. Yes. I, and the challenges you faced as a biographer. This is a generation that believed in greatness. Yeah. They were they were obsessed with Napoleon. They have this idea that there are great men and. They want to be a great man. And um, at a certain point, fairly early on, they're already in the business of living up to the legend as it's unfolding in their own minds. Mm -hmm. There are other figures of the same generation we've talked about. Them. Yeah. So there's a there's a challenge for you as a biographer, because uh, 
I, I think about the example you just gave to this question, the answer you gave to this question was, part of the answer was, well, he was just a remarkably intelligent guy. And uh, well, you might say, maybe he was, but there's a danger that you're, you, on the one hand, yes. you want to write a biography that's not a hagiography. That's right. That's right. And on the other hand, it, it's hard when you find yourself reproducing a version of, of him that he would be happy to hear. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and how did you um, confront that tension? Um, so I think it's reading um, and trying to kind of laying out all the battles and the victories and trying to trying to wrestle with how we can understand this. Um, and I think one of them, and so where am I getting where, this? What sources? So during World War I, we have legionnaires who are writing at the time about him. The first biography of Kosinski is written in 1915 by one of the commanders, senior commanders of the Polish legions. It's by a person named Wacław Sierraszewski. It's just interesting because I, I went, I actually used the copy in the, in the Butler Library. I was very happy that Butler Library has the original uh, published in Chicago, um, 1915, going through that it, because it is an absolute hagiography. Of this, it is the first attempt to reconstruct his childhood and ancestry. But in there, as a soldier, he's saying there was fanatic loyalty to him on the part of the legionnaires. And and he claims, um, and I put, I lay this out a little bit in the introduction where I discussed the literature, he claimed because there was a belief that he had a kind of integrity in which he would make no move that was not in the best interest of Poland. There was a trust that he could navigate the most a delicate diplomatic field where there's no Poland, there's three great powers at war and uh, Germany and Austria against Russia, uh, and he's being uh, sponsored in Austria, but he has to bring about you know, an end in which Poland becomes independent. Uh, and, and how does he, he do that when Germany and Austria are saying, you know, Galicia and, and our parts will never be part of it. Um, there's a sense that he could navigate that tricky field and figure out the one way that'll bring about the ends, uh, but that he wouldn't compromise those principles. Uh, you know, there's something to that because you, you're kind of getting a window into into this, but from a point of view of military, because I'm not a military historian, it's hard for me to really assess. Only that I, you know, noticed that, um, and I'm influenced by this, that he was the only uh, military commander to defeat the Red Army in the, in the 20th century uh, in the 1920 uh, Polish Bolshevik War, um, and you know, a British statesman who was on the inter-allied mission in Warsaw at the time, wrote 10 years later a book called The 18th Decisive Battle of World Civilization, The Battle for Warsaw. And what he said is that, is that the stakes were so high in 1920 that if Poland had fallen, the, the Red Army already stated that, that it was just a bridge to Germany, France, and Britain for the creation of the European Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. But who was the bulwark to stop that? And that was this one man, who had come up with some kind of, I mean, people use the word ingenious counteroffensive. Uh, you know, one of the, the the things I put in the book is just this this map here. I just want to show you. It's a map of the Polish Soviet. I I um, hired a map a, a professional map maker in London uh, for this book, and they they were able to draft me two uh, maps uh, for the Polish Soviet War. So the first. Is the Polish is the Soviet offensive between August 12 and 15. And you'll see here that this was seven miles from Warsaw. This is you'll see here it's the furthest thrust of the Red Army, but they are being surrounded by the Red Army. Uh, and um, all embassies, embassy staff of foreign countries have, have fled the country. And there's a there's a, a sense that Warsaw may fall. And because Germany is demilitarized, there's really no way to defend themselves against a Bolshevik onslaught. Uh, but then Kosutsky, with one of his generals, is able to come up with some kind of counteroffensive plan. And, and on the 16th, he triggers the start of the counteroffensive, and it, it's wildly successful. And you'll see this between the 16th and the 22nd of August. They, you know, they push back the Red Army 25 
to 40 miles. Uh, and they are moving so quickly in the pursuit of this retreat that the Western democracies pressure Kosinski to halt his offensive. Because uh, in his world, in, 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 what he would like is that the whole territory of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth would be liberated. Uh, uh, this is, I'm saying, saying this from what he uh, said in, in private and public, not for Polish conquest, so, but the, so that Ukraine could emerge as an independent state and would be a critical buffer between Russia and the West and an outpost of Western democracy. So that was his goal because here I show you know, that he, with the Ukrainian general Simon Petlura in May 1920, uh, with a joint Polish-Ukrainian force invaded Bolshevik Russia and they took Kyiv in on May 7th, 1920, but one month later, uh, and by the way, this is Petlura and Kosinski, one month later, uh, they couldn't hold down uh, a counteroffensive. And, and also they were hotly criticized by the Western democracies who belittled Pilsudski and claimed that he was uh, destabilizing Europe and that he was provoking Russia uh, uh, and, that, uh, and that he was starting new wars uh, and that Ukraine should not be a priority. And then Pilsudski turned to the West and he said, without an independent Ukraine, Europe will never be secure. And I thought that was very relevant for today because he said, you cannot compromise the, the territorial integrity of and, and rights of Ukrainians for, for self-determination, or we're going to be constantly uh, in a state of an onslaught against Trump from Russia. So that was his argument. And then the West um, you know, responded by saying that you are basically in trouble. Like, what are you doing? You're, you're destabilizing Europe. That's more question. Please, do what you say who you are. Yes, my name is Jennifer. I'm a master's student here at the Harvard Institute, and I focus on East Central Europe. Um, and I have two related, more general sure. questions. So um, are there any biographies that you particularly admire and maybe modeled this one after? Um, and you said that this was an academic biography, and I'm yes. curious, in your opinion, how that differs from a trade biography. Oh, okay. So it's interesting you said it, because this is actually a noted by the press as a trade book. Um, and I try to make it as readable as possible, but it's based on, on oh, thank you, on archival research in Poland, England, and the United States, um, including, for example, um, um, uh, Stanford University, Hoover Institution, which has huge amount of materials on, on Poland. And then we have the Pilsudski Institute in New York, and we have the Pilsudski Institute in London. And then, of course, in Poland, um, there's, massive archives that that you know I'm the innocent beneficiary of because if if I was doing this in 1978 those archives would be completely sealed and closed so I was able to go in uh, to those archives and there's like the um, Joseph and Alexander Pilsudski collection uh, that has something like 54 uh, files of you know personal letters and things about their children um, uh, an interesting feature of Kosutsky is that he was age 50 on November 11th, 1918, uh, when Poland became a state. And, but, but, uh, and on that day, he saw his eight-month-old daughter for the first time. So he was, uh, and then he had one child two years later. Um, so um, I, uh, I would say, so in terms of literature on him, uh, there's not, you know, what I, I actually really came to admire the Yenjeyevich biography. And the reason is because he himself served in the Pilsudski administration between 1933 and 1935. He was an education minister. Uh, so Václav Yenjeyevich passed away in 1999 at the age of 99. Um, so he and his older brother worked in the Pilsudski, Jan uh, worked. In, and so he, with that personal understanding, and then Yenjeyevich was head of the Pilsudski Institute for many years. And his intimate knowledge of the sources uh, made it so it was a particularly valuable insight into the mind of, of Pilsudski, uh, but without any scholarly apparatus. So I found that to be important. Now, I mentioned Andrzej Garlitsky, he, um, the late Andrzej Garlitsky, uh, though, even though it's a tendentious and very partisan you know, um, work from 1988, it is 704 pages uh, with. Footnotes, very meticulous footnotes, 
um, uh, and archival um, references. Uh, and in 1990, it came out reprinted, and then a colleague of Garlitsky's added a bibliography. And that bibliography is like 85 pages. In other words, Garlitsky found some young historian at Warsaw University who basically found everything that's ever been written about Kosinski and put it in a huge bibliography. So that became a major, major source for me. Um, in post-communist Poland, you have this plethora of works that are most of the, they're like coffee table albums of photographs. They say he's the most photographed person in Polish history. Um, and so I was wrestling with um, being confined to 42 <laughs> images. I was hoping for 85. I don't know where I got that. But I think the question, I may be misinterpreting, I think the question was not what sources of Piłsudski oh. did you rely on, but what other biographies were a model? Oh, so, I'm, see, I'm sorry. It wasn't, it could be, it it wasn't biographies of Piłsudski. I, I mean, see. That, that also. Yeah. So, um, well, I can just tell you. So, I'm, uh, I really like the works of, of um, I think it's Andrew Roberts. Do I have the wrong person mm -hmm. name? Um, and um, he, so I read his biography of Napoleon and his biography of Churchill. And I did that as I was putting together the materials to start writing. And I used that as a model because I so admire those works, um, mm -hmm. those biographies. The other thing is Adam Zamoyski, who wrote also an extraordinary biography of Napoleon that came out in, in 20, um, I believe 2018, or maybe it was 2014. And uh, so, and Adam Zamoyski's other works, now he, um, he wrote a biography of Chopin, for example. And I looked at that also with an eye to how is he constructing his biography, so I admire that. But, the, but there's something about the great, oh, oh, and the other, uh, so great um, biographies of, of great figures, because I was interested in biographies of European statesmen. So I would say the works of Andrew Roberts were the most important model for me. Mind you, uh, Julia Jackson's biography of De Gaulle. Oh yes, who of oh, course was there in Warsaw, overlapping with with yes. Um, you know what? I'm, I did not mention that, but that's also a Harvard University Press, mm -hmm. but it's a trade book. Um, I, I actually I purchased that, and I also went over. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was kind of interested in what he had to say about yes. Poland. So he because De Gaulle um, did actually meet Pilsudski in 1920. He was one of the military. Uh, advisors uh, in, in Warsaw, and they met, and there are sometimes comparisons between between Good. these two, De Gaulle's leadership and the Sutsky. Yes. So that also, I think, is important. I'd like to a couple more questions, perhaps. Maybe. We, 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 this is a hybrid, so maybe this is the time to see if there's some questions from Zoom. There's one question from Zoom, and the question is, is are there any plans to translate your work in German or Polish? Uh -huh. So uh, I know that the press is in contact with several um, publishers. And so far, we, we haven't gotten like a thumbs up. And part of it is because of perhaps economic reasons, the length is 640 pages. Um, but right now, I am in uh, the press is in direct contact with a French publisher for a French translation, which I think would have particular interest because um, one central aspect of the book is foreign policy, and Kosutsky based his foreign policy on the alliance with France. And so I give this, I give this picture here that his first state visit as head of state was in 1920, uh, uh, sorry, was in 1919, and it was to France. And he believed that France was the key to Poland's security. So he developed um, actually this, this um, an alliance that as actually was a, it was a um, an alliance which basically said that France will defend Poland's borders and Poland will defend France's borders. So it was a military uh, and political alliance. And the idea was that France was the key to the security of the new new states. So um, um, so I think that there could be interest in France. German I haven't had, and again you know maybe eventually a Polish publisher will. Take an interest. Well, um, it's time, I think. So perhaps you'll join me in thanking Professor Zimmerman for his wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.
So if you have um, several book talks already on the Greek independent postcard, they will mostly on the food. So it came, came out and it was still trying to do the time. Uh, yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I, did, I did some of them. But there was, it was the bicentennial of the authorized one, so there were huge numbers of them going on the bicentennial. 